Thank you, everybody. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a pretty focused talk on 3D printing in healthcare. Um, how many of you guys, as you know, most of you from medical device companies, um, have used 3D printers? Used a few. Good, good. Um, how many of you own them? A couple. Yeah, good. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically on um, 3D printing in healthcare. Um, really want to talk about the future, but before you can talk about the future, I think it's our due diligence to talk about where we've been, what's current today, and then where things may or may not be going. So you guys all know 3D printing, same thing, additive manufacturing, digital fabrication, rapid prototyping. All of those mean essentially the same thing. I think 3D printing's kind of taken over as the industry standard term. But when you look about look at additive manufacturing 3D printing, as you guys, most of you know who raised your hands, it's about layer by layer addition of material uh, until you essentially grow the part. So it's, it's exactly the opposite of milling, right, where you take a chunk of something, wood, metal, for an implant, and you whittle it down. 3D printing is the opposite, right? You grow it layer by layer, only growing what you want. So you look at um, the history of this, right? This patent, um, actually somebody else presented on this, and I kind of stole the slide, but the patent goes back to 1892. Um, at contour relief maps, right? This was the very first patent, you know, you know, well over 100 years ago, talking about creating a three-dimensional object in a layer-by-layer -layer fashion. I think it's very analogous, very synonymous to what we're talking about with 3D printing. So where are we in medicine, right? So when you talk about 3D printing in healthcare, you cannot, um, you cannot talk about it without also talking about the invention of CT scanning as well. Because most things in healthcare 3D printing in healthcare is about patient-specific models, implants, and none of that exists without um, the invention of the CT scan. So 1971, Sir Godfrey Hounsfield uh, invented the CT scan. What came next, right? Actually, before 3D printing was invented, um, there was a surgeon, Dr. Jeffrey Marsh, who, what he would do was take the CT scan, that comes in layer by layer, right, when you get a scan, and he would actually um, uh, shape out each layer and then stack them in metal plates. Cut out each layer, stack them together to create an anatomical model. He did that back in 1980. So that's really, I think, the first time this, was, this type of layer fabrication was used in healthcare. 1983, of course, Chuck Cole invented 3D printing. And then you can see pretty quickly after that, over a 30-year evolution, we went from basic anatomical models that started in um, 1988 all the way through really sophisticated things like in 2003, I'll show you, um, Dr. Salyer used a pretty remarkable anatomical model to separate conjoined twins. And all the way through today where we're doing complex implants, uh, complex anatomy models for training and simulation, and many other healthcare devices. So I thought this was a pretty good snapshot of the history of 3D printing in one slide. So you fast forward at 30 years, you know that something is mainstream officially uh, when it's on Grey's Anatomy. So I know you guys probably saw this episode last year, right? I'm not going to make you raise your hands. But this actually is a pretty phenomenal moment, right? When it does go mainstream and it's on something as popular as, as uh, Grey's Anatomy, they actually had a 3D printer in the hospital. A patient, of course, had a very exaggerated um, deformity of the heart, and they 3D printed out a model to be used in the operating room. Sounds pretty far-fetched, but actually it's done thousands of times a year now. Very, very common practice. So everywhere you look, you see something else on 3D printing in healthcare. So you guys are pretty familiar with this. So how exactly is it being used today as a medical device, right? This is a medical device conference. So I, it's very safe to say 3D printing is now a common use for manufacturing and medical devices where anatomical models, personalized surgery, patient-specific implants, bracing and casting, mass customization of medical devices like hearing aids, I'll talk about that, and also regenerative medicine and bioprinting. So I always um, steal this slide, but do reference uh, uh, Mr. DePrima, Matt DePrima, who's kind of the FDA specialist on 3D printing. He gave this slide or presented the slide last year, and I think it's a pretty phenomenal slide, especially for this group, right? So most of you, would you guys have known that there's over 70, and this was a year ago, so this number's much higher, over 70 added, 3D printed, additively manufactured devices cleared through 510K, right? That's probably a lot more than, than what most people would think. A majority of those 510K clearances are for orthopedic applications. I think most of us would believe that. And a significant increase in 510K clearance, 2011-2012. Um, 2011, That's really kind of the uptick of this. So about five years ago, um, 
it really started to take off in the industry. And you can see the different printing technologies, and I'll talk a little bit about this, not to bore you, but just maybe to educate you a little bit on what the technologies are. But you can see a lot of them are powder bed fusion, so taking a powder and sintering it or melting it together. Uh, and most of them are done in polymers and titanium. So those are the kind of the hot topics for 3D printed medical devices. So according to the FDA, there's five main types of 3D printing. And if you know this, great. If you don't know this, we don't need to memorize it. It's just more of an education, because most people think 3D printing is like one thing, one platform, and it's not. It's actually several different uh, platforms that make up the industry. Material extrusion, um, binder jetting, material jetting, stereolithography, and, and powder fusion. So what, what the heck am I talking about, right? So material extrusion is really, I think, the cheapest and easiest type, so I'll start off with that. It's really, in my mind, or how I explain it, it's kind of like a glorified hot glue gun. So somebody in the front row kind of agrees with that, right? It's, um, you start with a solid material and you kind of melt it as it comes out the nozzle on an, an XY axis, and you just, you know, with that um, contours, you start to print out your part and, and increase in, in Z, increase in your height. Um, what is the type? You know, so, so this is a pretty common application for this. It's a, it's a very cheap way to print um, detailed parts. This is actually a prosthetic hand printed by a group called Enable, so I'll talk about this at the end. What's another type? Binder jetting, also known as color jet printing. This is pretty cool because all it is, it's a pretty cheap powder. Um, it's just like printing on paper, except instead of printing on paper, you're printing on a layer of powder. And then the powder or the paper drops and you print on it again. You're printing full color and a glue. So essentially you're gluing together this powder layer by layer. So what can you get from this? A pretty beautiful model, right? So this is a full color model of the heart divided in two. So you can see from an education and training perspective and even from a, a patient uh, and surgeon perspective, this can be a pretty powerful model, all done through this color jet printing or binder jetting. Material jetting, a different kind, and again, we'll, we'll go through these pretty quick, but just to teach you, there's different kinds. It's an additive process with droplets of material are deposited on a layer by layer basis, typically with a support material as well. What you can get from this are some pretty advanced um, polymers, right? So you can, this is where you can start to print inflexible materials. It can be very cool, especially when you're looking at things like organs. So this is a, um, a kidney tumor. Right? So the tumor is hard and the material around it is soft, and I'll show a specific case study on this in a minute. Stereolithography, this is what Chuck Hole invented 30 years ago. So it's a liquid vat of resin, um, just a, a, a big box of resin, and everything the laser touches, it cures. So all the liquid around it will stay liquid. The laser will trace on the top of the um, surface and grow as the part goes down. And what you can get from this um, is a really, really accurate model, also some... Um, now, many have, uh, like we do, have cleared this for use in the operating room, so it's past cleaning and sterilization validation, so you actually take this into the operating room. But another thing you can do is add extra energy to parts of this polymer. It's UV sensitive and actually change color. So all in one print, uh, you can get a pretty extravagant model like this of conjoined twins where you want to look at the vessels between the two uh, bodies and start to use this for pretty advanced surgical planning. So I think it's a pretty phenomenal. And then the last one is powder fusion. So that you'd hear this um, SLS or, or direct metal printing. That's this powder fusion. So again, in a layer by layer fashion, you're starting with a bed of powder and you're um, sintering it or even uh, uh, welding it essentially together if you're using an electron beam. And you can do some pretty sophisticated models in metals, which is really the cutting edge for for medical devices and orthopedics today, um, and also some powders. So on the bottom you see a, a cranial implant that's a, a, a polymer based. So that's kind of the summary. So thanks for hanging with me. That was like the educational portion of the day. So I'm glad you were able to uh, hang through that. Um, but you can see the different a wide range of medical devices, and these are all medical devices that are printed today uh, using 3D printing. And of course, as you guys know, they range, the 3D printers themselves range from you know, a couple thousand dollars to up to a million dollars uh, in price, and all, all that uh, varies with the different technologies. So let's dive into the first one, anatomical models. And I think this is really the most basic and the most common use of 3D printing um, in healthcare today. So what am I talking about? So you start with a CT scan of a patient. Again, you know, very few um, patient-specific medical devices and, and something is, you know, that uses the technology of 3D printing um, has much of a purpose unless you can start with that medical imaging data. So what we do is you take that CT scan, you guys all know, again, you, 
go in and get an MR or CT and it comes in a layer by layer fashion, uh, but you have to convert that into a three-dimensional digital model before you can do anything with it. And that's where you start to see 3D printing in healthcare today. Um, it's a lot more than just the printer, right? So we take this CT scan and we go through this image processing, what we call, and I'll show you some details of this later. Uh, and then you go into model design, because sometimes let's say you're doing a, a shoulder, if you, just, if you just got the bony anatomy and you put it in a printer, it may fall apart, right? Because the ligaments aren't there. So it'd just be this, you know, a couple bones that fell apart. So you've got to add struts and color and labels, and then you take it to the 3D printer. So again, this is that uh, standard example I love to give. You can see how powerful something like this um, is in, in, in something like conjoined twin separation. And this is maybe an extreme example. Um, but this, actually there are kids all over the world that have these craniofacial diseases or disorders. And imagine being a surgeon and, and having a patient like this and not having the ability to pre-plan what you're going to do when you go into the operating room. So look how powerful, uh, like in Patero's case, he has a, a craniosynostosis, so his, his, um, his skull fused together early in, in along a, a few sutures. And so the surgeon you actually see can use the medical model to draw out where they were going to perform the operation, actually physically cut on the model, practiced before going to the OR. And you can see a pretty phenomenal result. Obviously a very talented surgeon as well, but something like having a patient-specific, accurate, one-to-one -one ratio anatomical model that can be sterilized and used in the operating room, how powerful of a tool that is. Here's another example, Grace, also the same surgeon, Dr. Salyer. She had an extreme cleft of the face. Um, as you can see, not, you know, a pretty difficult operation. So we got online and um, looked at this digitally, and you can see he took this medical model into the operating room and, and used it as a guide in the OR uh, to help perform this operation. So there's all different types of medical models, and we'll talk at the end about how we really think this technology will be democratized to the hospitals and into the hands of the clinicians, but very, very powerful um, use of these models. Another startup company, this is a very interesting one I wanted to be sure to um, show you guys. This is a surgeon who has a startup company. He's a plastic surgeon. So these people come in for um, plastic surgery and they want to visualize maybe what their nose would look like after rhinoplasty. Very hard to do, right? How do you, how do you project to somebody what they might look like after? Well, actually what they do is they take a 3, 3D scan of the face, full color, run it through a simulation program, and then print out a model of that patient. So you come in and you say, here is what you look like now. Here is your simulated post-operative result, what you may look like after surgery. Again, a very powerful example of how 3D printing um, is used in healthcare. And I have a video here. We'll when we saw the models, uh, our imaginations just flew off the charts. And what these soft, flexible models that are completely individualized allow us to do is to really do the surgery that we're about to do on the patient removing the, the cancerous area and preserving the healthy tissue on a model rather than doing it for the first time on the patient. We were in the operating one, room one day doing a robotic um, kidney surgery and we were thinking to ourselves, boy, um, it'd be great if we could feel or see this, this two-dimensional image that we'd been looking at on a screen in our hands and with our partners at, at 3D Systems, we were able to make a kidney and a kidney tumor that not only looked like a kidney, that not only was three-dimensional, that we could feel and touch in our hands, but it felt like a kidney. So you can see this is a really, really powerful concept, not only for the, for the surgical planning aspect of it, but also patient education, training. You imagine being a resident, not getting to um, you guys that maybe have been, we're all medical devices, right? So you see the OR, you've seen how difficult it is sometimes to participate, but from a teaching perspective, this is really a game changer. So I think this last video really um, explained it well. So let's take it the next step. So not just talking about printing an anatomical model, but going into what we call personalized surgery and how 3D printing is being used. So, so just let's think about the value proposition. So what is, you know, why is there a need for personalized surgery in healthcare? So from the patient's perspective, right, they want the best surgery possible, personalized to them, right? Makes total sense. That's what I would want for myself. The surgeon, they have to provide the best care possible to the patients, but they have to optimize how much they can do in a day. The hospital, to remain competitive, they must still cut costs, 
while still maintaining a high level of care. In the insurance company, they want to continue to fund high level of care for the patients, but at a de decreasing rates. And new treatments must demonstrate value. This is huge, especially for new technologies like 3D printing. And then the medical device companies like us, to remain competitive, we must innovate and provide better care at a diminishing selling price. So there's really a good value proposition, I think, for the need for personalized surgery um, in healthcare. Who started it off? I really uh, should attribute uh, this to the dental implant industry. So before you'd go in to get dental implants, again, millions of these are done uh, worldwide in a year, right? Very, very common application. Um, before they would just um, look at your teeth, maybe do a CT scan, and then visualize mentally where they're gonna drill to place those dental implants. And now a majority of that is done using pre-surgical planning, where you actually pre-plan, you get the digital version of the implant you're gonna use, you digitally pre-plan it, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, that's your, that's your plan, that's what you say you're gonna do, and then they 3D print a dental drill guide that's patient-specific, plan-specific, you put it right on the teeth, it tells you exactly where to place those implants. This is really the start of it. So I'm gonna give you an example of this, walk you through a case study of a boy named Blessing um, through what we call virtual surgical planning. So again, we start off with medical imaging data. You guys are, are catching on to that, right? And then before you hit print on the model, you actually go in and manipulate that data somehow. You have it in digital format. So why not take and run through the full surgical plan um, and print out patient-specific models, guides, and templates to use in the operating room? We have the ability to do this now. So here's a boy named Blessing. I actually got the opportunity to meet him uh, a couple months ago at our, at our opening, grand opening ceremony. Um, a very bright young boy from Africa who unfortunately had a landmine um, explode sort of in his face. Um, so he's left with very little anatomy, uh, very, very bright, actually an engineering student in Idaho um, now. Uh, but obviously he can't um, chew, he doesn't have teeth, he can't breathe very well, he can't speak very well, um, he has he's lost a lot of nerve sensation in his face. So a difficult uh, future for this young man. So using what we call this digital thread, you start with the medical imaging data, you move into the medical image processing, you get online and do a virtual surgical plan where you pre-plan the entire thing. Then you do 3D printing and then you can actually practice before going to the operating room, right? What a novel concept. So here's um, medical imaging data and, and finally I'm showing you what, it's, what I'm talking about for image processing. So this is a very, very typical CT scan. And what we can do is pick out the bony anatomy separate from airway, separate from the skin using what we call thresholding. So each one of those is a little black, uh, black or white pixel or everything in between. So we're starting to pull out the anatomy um, of the patient. Because what we have to do is create a three-dimensional model so we have something to print. So you can see we're pulling out the jawbone. That's the jawbone. Here's the teeth. I think even if you're not familiar with CT scans, you can recognize the teeth in this patient. And then here we are tracing the nerve. So you can see the power of what we can get from um, one good CT scan, one good set of medical imaging data. And then what we do is we know this, the size of those pixels, we know the field of view, we know the slice spacing. What we can do is then calculate that exact um, patient's anatomy in a three-dimensional um, structure. So that's what we do. We start with that and then we take it into virtual surgical planning. And this is a, a screenshot and I'll show you this. This is actually blessing with the surgical team up at the screen uh, doing a surgical plan remotely with, with a set of engineers from Golden, Colorado. So what are they looking at? They're starting with um, Blessing's Anatomy. So here's that patient again. You can see he basically had a piano wire holding his jaw together. He's lost all his teeth on the bottom. So the first thing the surgeons are going to do is go in and actually resect out um, some bony anatomy to clean up the edges. So you've got a good, a nice clean uh, surface to do the reconstruction. And then what they're going to do is actually take part of um, Blessing's fibula and use that, his leg bone, and use that to reshape his jaw. And we'll talk about maybe why things like bioprinting in the future may enhance surgery. Um, but we're pulling in normative data here. What you see in green is what a normal jaw should look like. And then we're going to take the fibula bone and digitally recreate uh, what his jaw should look like. Now this seems like a crazy operation. You guys have to know that this operation is done without surgical planning today, right? So the operation itself is very common. What we're adding is digital tools, right? This looks pretty complicated. How powerful is it to have this digital pre-planning 
uh, before they go into the OR. So at this point, all we have are pretty pictures, right? We have Blessing's anatomy. We've, what you see on the right is the VSP post-op, so the, the, the simulated post-operative result. So this is what the surgeons say they want to do when they go into the operating room. So very powerful. It's the first time they've been able to visualize that. So what we're going to do is take that anatomy and we're going to design patient-specific, plan-specific guides that are exactly for blessing and we're going to 3D print them and use them in the operating room. So they're patient-specific surgical tools. So a pretty powerful concept. And here's some of the examples of what we're going to do. We're going to simulate the plate, the fixation, how to put it all back together, uh, the cutting guides and jigs that go on the bony anatomy. And then we take that to the 3D printer. And you can see this is an example of stereolithography. I think it's a little bit dark, but you can see those models in there. So this is um, a pretty typical build. Um, overnight, we load up the machines. They 3D print all night. So this is stereolithography. So everything the laser is touching is getting hard. Everything around it, it's not getting touched. So it only draws out exactly the anatomy and some support structures. So it just drops like a tenth or um, 0.15 millimeters, and then it's going to do it again over and over and over again thousands of times to, until at the end you have your three-dimensional model in physical format and then it runs through a, a set of post-processing um, that then allows that to be shipped as a medical device with instructions for use, how to clean it, sterilize it, use it in the operating room. So this is a pretty standard case. We've actually done thousands of these at this point. A fibula free flap, a reconstruction of a jaw or craniofacial uh, area. And all of these are 3D printed medical devices with a cleared 510K um, that go and they're used all the time in the operating room. So here's an example. I, I didn't put too many surgery pictures in here. But you can see blessing on the lower left, the, the medical devices being delivered to the hospital on the, on the upper left. Um, in the middle picture, you see the surgeon using a 3D printed guide to cut the patient's fibula bone. And then you see the reconstruction uh, on the bottom right um, with that medical model again being referenced uh, in the operating room. So a pretty powerful concept. So here's Blessing holding his uh, 3D printed model. So I don't know if any of you guys saw this um, patient, a uh, pretty phenomenal uh, man named Patrick, uh, who's a firefighter um, out of Tennessee. And he um, received a full facial transplantation um, out of a NYU hospital just last August. We were fortunate enough um, to help Patrick uh, with the use of uh, our, our digital planning and 3D printing technologies uh, through our virtual surgical planning. Um, but what a powerful idea. Those of you that don't know, full facial transplantation, um, certainly not that common, right? So, um, so Patrick, obviously, he's lived about 10 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, and he uh, went through a, a, a lot of preoperative counseling and, and testing to make sure he was a candidate for this because this is a, you know, definitely an ethical, moral uh, type of operation that needs a lot of uh, scrutiny before, uh, you know, going into the operating room. And so what they do is they take a donor, so much like you would donate your kidney or your heart, you can also donate your face. Um, and so um, a young man out of New York, um, uh, and this is all public information, you know, so I'm not uh, telling you something I shouldn't. Uh, he was a, a bicycle messenger and got in an accident in New York. Um, and his family was generous enough to donate his face to Patrick uh, for this full facial transplantation. So he was a brain dead donor. And what you see on the left um, is his skeleton. So what they have to do is not, not only are they going to take the skin of Patrick, they're going to take some bony pieces as well and they take muscle and nerve and retransplant it onto Patrick. So what we helped with was we, one, we were able to digitally fit. How well is the donor going to match Patrick? You know, like we all come in all different shapes and sizes, so it's going to be very complex. Um, so we were able to digitally align the two pieces, the two um, patients' anatomy to see how good of a fit it was. And then we made 3D printed guides that you can see would resect. So the guides are what's in that, that red color and that were placed on the donor, placed on the recipient to, to dissect the bone. So whenever you brought the, the face over to, the, to, to Patrick, it fit perfectly. Um, so it was really a time saver uh, and really helped uh, in the success of the operation. But a really, really powerful use of the technology. Um, and as we all know, in a medical device company, it's all about uh, the patients and seeing studies like this, that cases like this that really keep us going. 
So this is also very common in knee guidance as well. So many of you that come from the orthopedic side, you'd be familiar with this. Um, many of the, well, all of the major orthopedic companies uh, have knee guidance, and, and most of them um, are actually 3D printed. So instead of doing a custom knee, what they do is they pre-size, pre-fit, um, and, and pre-place the knee to your x-ray or to your CT scan. Um, it is about um, improving patient outcomes for that, the person getting the knee replacement, but it's also a lot about reducing the amount of product that has to be in the OR. So before, I didn't know if you were size 8 or size 10 or size 12, so I had to have a range of 5 to 15, right, that needed to be in the OR when you went in to get your knee replacement. But now I know you are exactly a size 8 because we took your CT scanner, took an x-ray, converted it to a three-dimensional model. We pre-placed exactly where your knee should be positioned for the best uh, anatomical result. And then we could reduce, maybe we have 7, 8, and 9 in the OR. So reduced overhead by, some have said, up to 80%. So it's, a, again, a pretty powerful concept. And again, they transfer that uh, to the operating room by using these patient-specific knee guides that will then drill some pilot holes and cut some uh, planes and then allow for standard instrumentation to finish up the work. And then you know exactly where that off-the-shelf knee uh, should be placed. I think one of the most powerful concepts about um, 3D printing and, and, and pre-surgical planning um, is this idea that um, for the first time ever, um, there is a three-dimensional document that says, you the surgeon, this is what you said you were going to do when you went into the OR. So now what we can do with post-operative imaging is we can say, here's what you said you were going to do, and here's what you actually did. And so that's what this image is showing. And for the first time, you can actually take and say, so what you see in blue, let me explain it real quick, is what we said they were going to do. This is the surgical plan. And what we see in green is the actual post-operative result. So for a surgeon to get this feedback loop, it's very, very powerful. Um, we gave them guides and jigs to cut exactly where they should cut. We gave them the surgical plan before they uh, went into the operating room. And then you get a result like this, and you can say, wait a minute, where did I go wrong? What can I do in the future to do cases like this better? So I think this is, again, another very powerful concept um, of the use of the technology. So one of the hottest uh, trends right now in 3D printing in healthcare is printing in metals. Um, so these are long-term implantables. Uh, many stemming from orthopedic and spine. So you guys are shaking your heads, you're familiar with this. Um, whether it's patient specific or not, it's definitely one of the hottest trends I think in, in healthcare today. So here's a case example of a patient specific hip. So again, we know we're, we're, we've got it down that we can get a patient CT scan converted to a three dimensional model. What we can then do on that anatomy is um, 3D print or design a patient specific implant and then 3D print that patient-specific implanted metal so that it's exactly tailored. So not, not only do we have anatomical models, we now have surgical guides, but we have 3D printed long-term uh, implants that are used in the operating room. One of the things we like to say with metals 3D printing is complexity is free. Those of you guys in orthopedics know that many of the implants that go into the OR are multiple manufacturing steps. It's one manufacturing step to uh, whittle it down to a solid part. It's another manufacturing step to add on a porous structure. Uh, and then you may add on other biologics as well. But with 3D printing, we say complexity is free. It doesn't matter if they're all the same size or all v slight variances uh, as they're patient specific. Complexity is free, so we can do this very economical today. And actually, another one of the surprising things is many standard implants, not patient specific implants, but standard implants with complex structures um, like spine cages are 3D printed because actually the economy, the, you know, the economics of 3D printing that complex shape is cheaper uh, than doing it with standard methods. Here's another example of um, a patient-specific spine implant. So somebody had a collapsed disc, they needed to, to go into surgery and have this, uh, you know, the spine disc implanted. So what we were able to do digitally was actually take that patient's anatomy, which you see in the upper right, and actually um, you know, move it apart a little bit to more simulate their normal spine structure because it's collapsed over time as their disc has eroded. And we actually digitally adjusted the spine with the surgeon's input, obviously, and then designed a patient-specific spinal implant. Um, this is a company out of uh, Germany doing this. So I think it's just really powerful 
case examples of how 3D printing uh, is being used in metals. This concept is really fascinating. How can you use 3D printing in bracing and casting? So here is a, a patient population um, that really has it tough. So this is a, a, a female wearing a scoliosis brace. Uh, those of you that are familiar with this, scoliosis uh, typically um, is treated, it's most common in young females, and it's typically treated at that growth age when they're you know, young women. So ages uh, maybe 12, uh, you know, 10 to 15, let's say, during that high growth period. And the only way you get better as a young female with a scoliosis brace is if you wear this god-awful brace up to 20 hours a day. Could you imagine? And some of you are shaking your head whether you've had it or, or know somebody. It's all about compliance, right? You have to wear the brace to get better. The brace is hideous. It's hot. It's bulky. It has metal rods. Imagine being a female having to wear this. But what if you could make the brace beautiful, right? What if you could use 3D printing to scan the patient? They could, the young female could pick out the pattern. She, she loves flowers. Let's put flowers on her scoliosis brace. Let's make it low-fitting and breathable so it's not so hot when, when she's wearing it. If you make it beautiful, what happens, right? She wears it more. It's more comfortable. It's patient-specific. It's made just for her. So this not only is it beautiful, but she's getting better because she's wearing the brace more. So it's a really powerful concept where complex design, patient-specific imaging, anatomy, with 3D printing, can do pretty phenomenal things with a, a, a really a neglected patient population today. And let's take this a step further to bracing and casting. You know, a lot of us, if, whether you've had it yourself, your kids have all been here, right? I had a 12-year-old boy who broke his wrist. I mean, by day three, that thing smelled horrendous, right? Like, like, it's awful. But what if you could have a brace like this that these young girls are wearing, this fracture cast, that you could spray off with a hose, that you could unhinge for a second and wash underneath there and then place it back on? And what about this boy on the right, again, this company called Unique that's doing pretty amazing things. He has a, um, obviously a prosthesis on his leg, um, but what he could do is get a covering for that prosthesis. Maybe he likes Iron Man and he wants to 3D print an Iron Man prosthesis to wear around on his leg so he's cool, right? It's an expression of him. Um, we're, we're doing this today in these, with these medical devices. And again, to go back to this group called Enable, have any, has anybody heard of Enable? This is a really powerful group. So what they're doing, kids that um, need hand prosthesis, right? Um, so what they're doing is providing a low-cost alternative and fun and, and great alternative to traditional hand prosthesis. So what you can do and, and, and what I could do if I had a 3D printer, so all you guys that raised your hand before could be a part of this. What they do is, is, is pair up people that have 3D printers with kids that need hands. So I can go online and say, I have a 3D printer. I would love to use it uh, for this purpose. And I can sign up and help John, who wants a Wolverine 3D printed hand prosthesis. And it's a, very, uh, it's a very fun and very exciting thought process. And it's done very cheaply. So this is maybe $25 worth of goods. You can do it certainly at a low level. And then you could obviously make it more and more extravagant, depending on the printers and the technology that you have. But this is the type of. This is the type of result that you can get, um, all 3D printed with, again, some strings and, and wires attached at the end. So they call it this, this maker, you know, pay it forward, maker philanthropy. And I think this concept is very powerful. Now that we have technology that can do very complex things at a very low cost, I think it's going to change the game for some of these. Um, again, this is a medical device, right? And then as we're winding down here, I want to talk about mass customization. So many of you guys may or may not be aware of um, the hearing aid industry. Uh, so, so it's actually been going on for a few years, but most hearing aids, they take a scan uh, of your inner ear, and then they 3D print patient-specific hearing aid shells uh, that are designed and print, and they print thousands of these a day. Same thing with Invisalign. So you guys all know this technology. So actually the aligner itself is not 3D printed, but all the teeth molds that they use, you know, so it's just like braces, right? Those of you that don't know Invisalign, it's like the new brace thing. Um, so instead of having the, the wire, you put in a series of trays that take you from step one to step 28 when your arch is perfectly aligned. And again, you may have 12, you may have 50 of these different trays. So they use 3D printing on a mass scale, thousands a day to 3D print these teeth molds that then they use to investment cast the aligners themselves. 
again, I think it's a great proof of, of mass customization. And again, the, the shoe sole industry. So this is a hot one going on right now too. Custom orthotics. Take a scan or a picture of your foot and then 3D print uh, a, a, a shoe and sole. And this is a startup company I wanted to add because I think it has the potential to be a part of this mass customization, CPAP. Um, you guys are familiar with the, the growing epidemic of, of sleep apnea amongst adults. Um, CPAP, these custom, um, these, they're not custom, most of them are not custom today, but these masks, these oxygen, essentially oxygen masks you wear at night. Um, but most of them are pretty hideous looking, if I am to be honest, and, and most of them don't fit patients very well, so they actually don't help the patient all that as much as they could because you're losing a bit of oxygen due to the bad fit of the mask. So this company called MetaMason is, is using a scanning and 3D printing technology uh, to, to cast out these silicone patient-specific uh, CPAP masks. So the last kind of main area I want to talk through a little bit, just to give it a full um, appreciation of 3D printing in healthcare, is, is, is the pharmaceutical and bioprinting industry. And I'll just mention these briefly. Uh, it's mostly the work of other people, but you guys all saw this probably last year, the first 3D printed drug that was approved by the FDA. That's a seizure medication. So um, the idea of this is you can um, 3D print with the, with the drug, you can you can tune in on that patient's specific dose that they need. Um, and it also can be an efficient way of, of manufacturing as well. So this was the first 3D printed drug, I think one of many uh, that is to come. Some pretty phenomenal work of 3D printing of organs. So Anthony Atala's group out of Wake Forest, uh, they're doing some pretty phenomenal 3D bioprinting of, of organ uh, kidneys and, and liver tissues. Organovo uh, doing human uh, liver tissue uh, printing. I loved this one, uh, the, the organ um, body on a chip. So what they can do is print these cells on a chip and they can use um, these cell structures that are uh, representative of many different organs uh, in the body. So essentially a makeup of the body and they can use this for, for, um, for testing, um, um, you know, like cures for, for viruses or, or other drugs that, uh, you know, based on epidemics you know, large, um, you know, large uh, diseases that they want to test. They can test these on these uh, body on a chip instead of testing it on animals or testing it on humans. So it's a pretty phenomenal idea and lots of very uh, interesting stuff going on in skin, um, 3D printing, and then um, ears as well as the, the, this has gotten a lot of um, attention from Scott Hollister's group doing the tracheal stent, right? I think a lot of us have seen this in healthcare. So that was just a snapshot. So I'm going to end with localizing the technology. Um, although it's a lot of it's done at medical devices today, I really do feel that this technology is going to be localized uh, to the hospitals. And how we handle that and how we collaborate and how we evolve that as medical device companies I think is very important. For example, the Mayo Clinic has started a um, collaborative 3D printing in medicine. So radiologists are really taking this and owning it because it's kind of an extension of a CT scan when you go back to medical models, right? And they've also started a journal of 3D printing in medicine. And we're seeing more and more hospitals that want to take 3D printers into their own hands, use them, and print their own medical devices in the hospital. And uh, talk, talking to the guy earlier about uh, regulatory and quality, uh, hospitals aren't necessarily known for their extravagant quality systems. Um, nor does the FDA govern hospitals, right? Uh, so I think it's an interesting uh, evolution of 3D printing in healthcare, but it's going that way and, and we have to be a part of it. And then uh, two more things to end on, building evidence in 3D printing. So most of the things I talked about, like anatomical models, they don't have insurance reimbursement codes. It's a new technology. It doesn't have insurance support. So many of the medical device companies are, are coming together to help um, hospitals and clinicians put on these studies to build evidence for 3D printing so we can get things like reimbursement. And then I'll end with the future technology for rapid 3D printing.
The objective has always been to disrupt conventional manufacturing. So this is really what I think the future of 3D printing and medicine is. Taking what we do today and doing it 50 times faster. So what used to take hours literally now grows in minutes. It changes the way that we make medical devices for patients, right? As technology becomes more local and as this 3D printing technology becomes 50 times faster, it's a whole different medical device industry than it was 20 years ago. And I think that's a great um, ending, ending note. So thank you guys so much for listening for the last four minutes. So a few questions for the audience. Who, who thinks it was worth my persistence to get Katie here today? Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Who thought that was really cool and you saw things you hadn't imagined before? Now, importantly, I want to ask this crowd in particular. Who here heard an idea that inspired you that you think you can bring back to your businesses? I expect fewer hands here. Um, because of the, you know, it's, it's not an immediate, mm -mm. you know, uh, application for, for most folks. So I guess my one question in the interest of time sure. would be, how might you address the other 80% of the room that saw what's possible, but right now they're not seeing how it works for their business? It's a broad question, but perhaps you can attend. No, it. and it's a very common, um, you know, it's a very common evolution of this technology. We do what we do today. Um, because it works in our system. Medical devices are sticky, right? Once you get something cleared, once you get it to market, for good reason, it's difficult to change. So it does take time. And I think what you'll see first is the evolvement from an engineering perspective. So how you used to think about designing something based on the constraints of a, of a milling machine don't exist anymore. And it takes time for this evolution. Uh, to take place. So it's a very common, um, it's a very common ev evolution, but I think keep it in the back of your mind. Know that um, it's not unknown. I think people are a little, in medical devices, we're scared of the unknown. But I think what I showed today is that it is a common tool in medical devices. There are people that can help consult. There are people that can help you uh, use this technology in medicine, not just in aerospace and automotive, where I think most of us thought 3D printing lived. Ladies and gentlemen, my new best friend, Katie Weiner. <laughs>